so you should be good. Use hashtag identity week. And then if you'd like to tag us and follow us as well, it's at Mr. Samuel French. And just to note that next week, because of Identity Week, we're shifting and changing our Twitter handle to at Samuel French NYC. So if you see that change, that's why. Um, get the Wi-Fi. Everybody's good. I see. Looking on phones. Awesome. Um, and yes, also, we're so excited for our panelists and moderators. So I'm going to hand it over to them now. Adam Hetrick is our moderator for today, the editor-in-chief of Playbill.com. Go ahead, sneak in. And uh, we're going to bring them out on stage and get started. Have fun. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Hi, it's so nice to see all of you. Um, my name is Adam Hetrick. I'm the editor-in-chief of Playbill.com. Uh, we're thrilled to partner with Sam French this week, uh, this year for Identity Week. Um, this evening, I'm joined by an incredible uh, group of panelists, all of whom I will let uh, introduce themselves to you tonight. Uh, my name is Donnie Cianciato, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Hi, my name is Puya Mohseni, and I'm a her if there ever was one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bianca Lee, um, she, her. Hello, I'm MJ Rodriguez, and she and her are very perfect to me. Hi, I'm Azure D. Osborne Lee. I'm he, him, or they, them. Uh, this evening we'll be discussing a lot of uh, some topics that cover uh, the identity and lives of transgender artists on stage and off. Um, and I think so we've had a chance to speak backstage a bit. Uh, something we wanted to start off on is sort of the claiming of the uh, trans identity and how that blossoms as an artist and how um, that opened up artistic channels for each of you in your own personal lives and your professional lives. Uh, well, for me, it was um, something I didn't necessarily anticipate happening. I had uh, you know, been an actor my whole life and gone to college for musical theater, and that was before I had come out and started transitioning. And when I did that, I was uh, 30 years old, and I kind of thought, well, there goes my musical theater career, because <laughs> you know, my voice is going to change, and who's going to hire the trans guy? And about four years later, I saw an open audition call for a show called Southern Comfort at the Public Theater that said they were specifically looking for transgender actors. And I had not really done anything for four years um, because of the transition. And so in my case, uh, you know, when I thought that transitioning was going to be the thing that closed the door and, and shut off any opportunities, it totally opened this, uh, this door for me. And I ended up getting the part, moving from Arizona to New York to do the show, and um, have worked here now a couple of times because they're looking specifically for transgender actors. So here I thought that I was shooting myself in the foot by coming out, and instead it was one of the best career choices I could have made. <laughs> um. I transitioned many years ago, uh, about 18, 19 years ago. And at that time, New York was less uh, accepting. Uh, so my aspirations of being an actor and model at that time were uh, rather futile. Um, people wouldn't return my phone calls and all of that. So I left the business, because at that time, I saw there was really no room for me. And I really wanted to transition. That's why I had come to this country to be able to do that. And many years later, kind of acting found me, and at this point I had transitioned and I was living comfortably in stealth. Um, and then about a year ago, about a year and a half ago, I started thinking that it's not enough. I have to come out. I want to come out. I need to have a voice. And the day that marriage equality was passed at Supreme Court, I decided this is the day. And I thought, well, you know, my acting career, okay, goodbye, whatever I have. This is going to be it. I publicly came out, and wouldn't you know, that was not it. Um, it, like, like Donnie was saying, it gave this other side to my career, uh, but not just my acting career. I got to talk about things that were important to me, talk about things that I felt weren't being talked about, and I got to talk about it with authority, not in a third person kind of voice. So I feel me coming out opened different avenues to me as an artist and also gave me a voice to share with other people as a trans woman who was also a performer and a writer. 
and I'm very grateful for that voice. Hi. Well, I'm not going to be quite as positive. So buckle your seatbelt. No, I'm just not. Um, for me, it's a double-edged sword. Um, I transitioned over 30 years ago. Um, I was five years old. No. Um, yes, you were. Yes, you were. I was the first trans child. Um, and I remember, you know, uh, my acting teacher at Rutgers, she said, okay, if that's what you want to do, do it. But stick with theater. You know, slip in there because Hollywood wants nothing to do with it. They're much more conservative out there and they're much more afraid. So I moved to New York. Um, and I think one of the things I, I, I knew I always identified as female, always. Um, but I did go to acting school um, as male. And one of the things that kept coming back to me every time we did a scene or I was cast in a show, I didn't get the part that I really wanted. The part that I really wanted was a female. So it really kind of convinced me that that truly is how I identify those. Um, that's the perspective that I share. Um, so I transitioned and I was very young and a little naive. Um, I was lucky enough, doors were closed to me. I was very lucky. There's a very thin layer of theater. Um, you have uh, the legit, you know, equity stuff, and then you have all that stuff that doesn't pay. And then there's a small layer that does pay, uh, that's usually from grants, things like that. And I was able to be a working trans actress for many years in New York. Um, nothing huge, nothing that would blow your socks off, but I was very grateful for that and for all the downtown artists that cast me and collaborated with me. Um, my goal is one day not to be seen as a trans actress, but as an actress who knows her shit, <laughs> who happens to be trans. And I think that is, you know, where a lot of people, you know, uh, when it comes to alternative casting, you want to be cast because of your talent. Um, the dream is to have a character that happens to be trans or isn't necessarily trans or may not be trans. Um, sometimes when you keep playing trans characters, sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but you sort of end up saying some of the same kind of things over and over and you think, I am a transsexual. I don't want to play one over and over and over. I want to play everything. Doctors, lawyers, you know, astronauts, all these different stories. That's why all of us got involved in this to begin with. So on the one hand, I'm thrilled that the doors are, I know I'm talking a lot, sorry. <laughs> but I'm old. I got a lot to say. Um, the doors are opening up and, and people want to help and they want to write these characters and they want to cast us more and more and I think that's great and I'm very happy for that but like I said I I, I would I want more what can I say um that was beautiful Thank you. um for me um I had always thought of myself as you know a little girl I, in my mind I had always thought of myself as a little girl for ever since the age of seven and I knew I was like praying to God like please make me this like wonderful girl and then I found out down the line um, that was going to happen, but it wasn't going to happen like how I expected it to. I wasn't going to magically wake up a woman one day. I had to become one. Um, and that one of those most defining moments for me, well, actually, before that defining moment, I had a, a long process of figuring that out. When I, I, re, I had gotten a show it called Brent, and I played Angel, and I, I was playing one of my dream roles, but um, at that point it wasn't enough for me in my mind. I was going into, you know, I was leaving out of the backstage door and I was seeing all these people and they saw me as someone that I, I didn't see myself as. 
and I was like, okay, this has got to change. I started getting, you know, trans roles, but it still wasn't enough until five years down the line when I decided to chemically transition <laughs> and um, start taking HRT, going, going on HRT, and really figuring out time and thinking about who I truly wanted to be for myself and not anyone else. That's when it happened. And um, recently, I had gotten called in for a cis role, and I thought it was the most beautiful thing ever because one, it shows that this world is changing and that, that they're starting to see us as normal individuals because we are. And um, tell them what the role was. Yeah. Oh, the role. The, I got called in for Peggy for um, Hamilton, and um, I got a final call back. Thank you. And it was it was the most defining moment in my life because it showed diversity within the musical theater realm and that there is a possible chance that there will be soon, someday, a trans woman or a trans man on, on a Broadway stage. It hasn't happened yet, but it will happen soon. And I think that was one of the most amazing moments in my, my life. And as a trans woman, it, it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. So yeah. Um. So I'm just gonna ask you to repeat the question since I'm the <laughs> like, like, absorbing a lot. Uh, I was asking everyone um, how uh, claiming your trans identity also helped the way your artistic identity uh, came forth and bloomed. I mean, I yet to be seen. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that it's helped, uh, but I feel like it. It is. It is a part of who I am. Uh, so I started out in theater as a performer, as an actor, and sort of my freaky weird kid story is that, you know, like I read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy and also have always been very willful. And so, you know, when I was in middle school, I just insisted that I should be considered for all roles, you know, <laughs> like male or female, you know, it's like, whatever, I can play anything. And so, uh, you know, I played Squire Trelawney and Treasure Island, as well as the voice of everyone who fell overboard uh, <laughs> from backstage. So I would just like give this big manly yell. Um, and my parents just kind of let me do what I wanted to do. I mean, they're, they're engineers, and I think they were just happy that I was out of trouble for the most part. And uh, goodness, I have a story that I tell in high school about coming to, to school one day, and I was dressed like half, half as half man, half woman, and everybody was like, did your parents see you? And I was like, yeah, I drove to school with my dad because I was getting my learner's permit. Um, and so I identify as non-binary. I'm not a binary trans person. Uh, and so fast forward until my like mid-20s, I'm getting ready to go to school for experimental theater in London. I'm back home in Texas watching True Blood, and then I was like, oh shit, uh, I've realized something about myself, and I'm not going to deal with this right now because I'm getting ready to move to London. So I moved to London, I did that, um, realized that I was trans and needed to transition, but didn't tell anybody because I was like, I don't even know if I'm gonna talk to you people anymore. I, you know, after I leave here, I was very clear I'm not gonna stay in London. So I came back to New York City, and and for me, there was really a pause in my arts career. I feel like for many trans people, you know, the decision to medically transition is a decision to take a step back um, from working in the way that you're familiar with working. Uh, and so that's when I really, I became an arts administrator, which is very important to my career as an artist and very much who I am as well as an artist. I'm an arts administrator. Um, and so now I'm writing plays. I'm, people are asking me to audition for stuff, which is kind of weird to me because I haven't really, you know, like my, I don't even have like recent headshots really. Like my headshots are from like when I was like 24 um, and still living as a woman. Uh, I have like a selfie. It's a very nice selfie, but it's a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> that I guess is a headshot. But anyway, because I do things like this and people are looking for, oh, especially if they're looking for any kind of like black trans male actor, like geez, I will get that casting notice. Like that breakdown will come across my de desk 25 <laughs> times because people don't know where to find them, right? So now people are, I actually have an audition next Saturday because people are like, you wanna come audition for this show? And I'm like, I guess I will do that. 
and they're asking me to include me in things. And I, to be honest with you, I do feel like it's part of the trendiness of transness. But I also understood when I stepped away from acting when I was living as a black woman that there was a limitation of the roles that were available to me and that I was not prepared to be in a situation where I would be judged based on my looks and like, this black don't crack, like I'm 32, I look good, you know? <laughs> like, and I don't look old enough to play the roles that are out there, and I knew that about myself. You have to know what you look like if you're an actor in this town, you know? You have to know. Um, so, yes, I'm getting asked to do things because I'm trans, but also I feel like people get asked to do things all the time for reasons that don't have anything to do with how talented they are or how hard they work. Who they know, what they look like, what door they walked in, how much money they have. So while I do get asked to do things because I'm trans, that's fine, I'll take it, especially if it pays. Well, um, and I'd like to ask something that you all, all touched on, uh, the sort of intersection of um, being trans and uh, politics. And there's sort of like, there's power in visibility right now. <laughs> Uh, but as you said, there's also a great desire to move beyond strictly being cast in trans roles or only telling trans stories. Um, where do you feel you are now as uh, a community, as an individual, and is, is there an ultimate goal that, that one day that, um, I know for Puya, you certainly say that it was a very political act for you to identify and come out, as you say. Um, are you ready to move on beyond, these story, beyond this identification? Is there a day that you hope that you get to move on? Well, I'm, I'm going to start this because there was something Bianca said, um, and it actually pertains to what you asked. You know, there was a time that I thought, I don't want to play trans characters before I came out. I didn't want to be thought of, remembered as a trans actor. But Viola Davis will never be asked to play a white woman because there is a range of female characters that can be African-American and they can be varied and uh, they can have different temperaments, they can have different backgrounds, but nobody would ever say, well, aren't you tired of playing black woman? Or, or Meryl Streep playing a white woman. I am a trans woman. I, I embrace it. I have worked so hard to get to where I am. I have I have bled and, and cried and have seen people um, that their voices are never going to be heard. I have no problem now playing a trans character. What I do have a problem with is that people seem to think there's only one kind of trans character, and there isn't. There are trans doctors, there are trans engineers, there are trans mothers, there are trans hookers, there are, um, there are people who transition much later <laughs> in life. I, I gave her a look, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a hooker, I promise you. <laughs> well, you know, I always say it's a matter of how much you get paid. Um, but I think for me, personally, and, and I always wanna say this because even though we all happen to be trans, I promise you, there's no trans agenda. If there is, nobody sent me the invite. <laughs> uh, there's no such a thing as transgenderism. I hate that word. I really hate that word. It's no not an ism. It's, it's really, there's no ism. There's no ism. You just is. There's uh, the <laughs> same way there's no straightism or gayism, uh, unless there is. I am not and aware of it. Transgender so. is an mm -hmm. adjective. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a noun. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. You don't transgender into something. <laughs> you are. Um, and when I look at that, I think, I would like to be that voice, um, not necessarily for something political, because we happen to be part of the fabric of society. Some of us are mothers, some of us are single, some of us um, have uh, had an easier time transitioning. It, you know, again, we come, I mean, look at us, that there, there's five of us here, and we all have a very different journey that has brought us to here. Sure, if somebody wants to cast me in, in a cis character because um, essence-wise uh, and uh, you know, like talent-wise, I'm right for it, I wouldn't say no. I mean, you know, especially if they pay. Um, that, that would totally be great, I mean, you know. Um, but if somebody remembered me as someone who played many variations of a trans character and it got to show the audience that we come in all different colors, we come from all different backgrounds, we don't all sound the same, we don't all look the same, then, then that would be something that I would be proud of. 
And yes, like Bianca said, I would like the day where we move past that. But I would like to at first get to the point that there is more than two variations of a trans character and then move beyond the fact that, okay, we can realistically expect our audience to see an actor they know to be trans and have them believe that this character can play a non-trans character. At this point, most of our audience has a problem looking at a gay character and imagine that they could be in love with a woman on the screen. So part of that is you know, seeing where we are and looking at where the next step is. For me, personally, the next step is asking playwrights, asking casting directors to see us as varied. We don't sound the same. We don't, I mean, even here, we are not even all from the same ethnicity. And I would like that before being allowed to play something other than just a trans character. You know, for me, there was nothing political about theater. You know, um, I was a kid that was starstruck. I thought I wanted to be a movie star, and then I went to uh, an acting conservatory that was theater based, and I fell in love with that. And, you know, all I wanted to do was play Mad Margaret and Blanche Dubois, and, you know, like any other actor. I had, you know, that's what I wanted. And after transition, of course, that complicated things. But I remember when I first started out. None of us thought it made any sense to transition and then tell people about it. On paper, it doesn't make any sense. You know, why would you go through all of this and then just tell people, I'm not really what I appear to be? And over time, that began to change. Because in real life, it is better. Because for many of us, for some people, stealth works just fine. But for many of us, secrets are corrosive. And I remember one day, my friend, um, I had gotten what we call spooked, which means somebody, you know, found out, clocked, you. clocked, clocked, me, clocked, you. clocked spooked, whatever. Right. And I was very upset, and I, I cried to my friend, and because just you know, when you see that look in someone's eye, when they see you as one thing and then your value diminishes in their eyes. That's very painful. And it's reality for, for, for most of us. We, we've seen that, we've gone through that. And my friend said, you know what? What did this person know? This person knew that you were a transsexual. We didn't use the word transgender back then. This person knew that you were a transsexual so what? You are a transsexual. And, and, and then I, groups started popping up, support groups, and people were, were being out, and trans women and trans men, and the idea of, yes, this is what I am, and I don't give a flying what people think, you know? Bleep. And I think, you know, that, so that, the political, the personal became the political, and I don't, you know, a lot of the things that I have done and been asked to do are very uh, socially conscious, you know, uh, and that's great, that's fine. I mean, there's always a part of me that just wants a good juicy role, mm -hmm. you know, um, but a lot of that activism has, has rubbed off on me. And, you know, I see it, I see it with my sisters, I see it with how, how beautifully Laverne has stepped up to the plate. And um, yeah, I mean, we now look at roles, we look at scripts, we're asked to look at scripts that we're not necessarily gonna work on mm -hmm. and ask for our feedback and we give it, you know? So there's many times I've been in a show where I've had to say, okay, I'm not speaking to you as an actress, <laughs> I'm speaking to you as a trans woman. Okay, now that, Issue is done. Now I'm going to put my actress cap back on. Right. You can tell me shut the fuck up. <clears throat> and um, wait, can you repeat? Oh. Sure. No, I was just asking about the sort of intersection of political of self-identification and also wanting to move beyond that and to play um, a 
gender specific role? You know what? When I officially like affirmed it and owned myself, I had no problem with anyone knowing I was transgender. And I took pride in that because I worked, as we all say, as transgender individuals, we work so hard to be who we are and most importantly, to just fit in a space where we can feel normal, because we are normal. Um, as you, you put yourself in a, a situation and you, you, when you go into, a, a, for, for instance, an acting, a acting scene or anything, you don't want to be placed into a, a space where you're, one, you're wondering. You don't want that. You want to feel completely normal. I would love, to, I personally would love to see more day-to-day -day things that have to do with trans people and that they have regular relationships. You know, I mean, you don't see that often. There are small, pop up, there are small groups that have that, but you don't see it as often. I would like to see that more and broadcast it on news, on television, because people need to see that it happens. You can get married. You know, you don't have to, you're not alone for the rest of your life. Like, that's just not what trans people do, and that's what the masses think. And that's never the case. That's never the case. We can book jobs, we can have relationships, we can have kids, and we can survive. We can live. Let me fix that. We can live. That's what we can do. Live joyous and free. Exactly. We can live joyous and free, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that trans people who are um, feeling some type of way about being quote unquote trended, I think it should kind of be dropped a little bit because it is shedding light on us and it's creating a space of comfortability because if it wasn't happening, none of this would be possible. We wouldn't be able to sit up here mm -hmm. and talk about our stories. That's, I, I have to you know, agree with that. And, and I think that if you're an out transgender person, um, publicly living your life, whether you are trying to or not, you are making a political statement. And you are involved in that discussion. And it's, you know, I never set out to be a transgender ad activist or advocate. If you told me a year ago that I'd be sitting here right now doing this, I wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't have been on my radar. Um, but it's not something that I would say no to because it's important and, and needs to be done. But I still just want to be an actor. Like when it's all said and done, book me in a show pay me to do what I love to do and what I studied to do and I'll be happy. I just happen to be an actor who is transgender. And in a way that has benefited me because it is trending right now. And it is, you know, the, a, a topic of conversation. And, you know, whether, whether you're familiar with, whether you watch Orange is the New Black, you know that there's a transgender character on that show. Whether you like Caitlyn Jenner, you know who she is. Um, you know, five years ago, that wasn't the case at all. And so just by having these conversations, we are being political, even though what we're all really saying or what it sounds like we're all saying is we just want to work. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah. please just book us in theater or film or something. That's what we're here for. But we're also trans, so we're going to talk about this, too. So you kind of, it's hard to separate um, the po politics from your personal life. Well, and take us into the rehearsal space and the audition room, because I think there's a lot of uh, communication that's an education, certainly, from casting directors, artistic directors, um, people who basically are the gatekeepers. Um, what are some of the conversations you would like to have? I know that there was, Donnie, you did uh, Southern Comfort at the Public Theater, and there was some discussion at the time when um, cisgender actors were cast in trans roles in that production. Um, Let's talk about what the conversations you would like to have with artistic directors, with casting directors. Um, what? Let's talk about it. I can talk about that forever. <laughs> um, I think you know uh, uh, the the first place to start. It's, it's such an obvious statement, is that we need to see more of an effort. We need to see casting directors and agents and directors make more of an effort if they're looking for a transgender character specifically. Prove it. Show us. Um, you know, like in, in Southern Comfort's case, uh, it was at the public and it was an equity show, and I was not equity, but they held open auditions. So I was able to audition for that part and play a transgender character. I had to join equity. But, um, you know, it opened a door for me because they asked. And I don't remember having seen another casting call 
like that, and that's not to say that there wasn't one at a, at a different theater or another city, but that was the first time that I saw a casting call where I went, wow, they're looking for me. And that's four or five years after I'd given up doing this because I didn't think anybody was ever gonna look for me. And the, the impact, not just on my career, but on me personally as a, as a human and as somebody who, you know, being transgender, even when it's trendy, it's not easy. Um, we have, you know, a lot of things that we have to go through and, and stupid discriminatory things about where you can pee and where, you, I mean, just, you, you all know. Uh, so to have somebody say, I see you, I'm acknowledging you, I'm asking you to come be a part of this, for me personally was um, at just an absolute blessing. So it's not just a matter of like accurate casting that we're asking for, like you can change the world. You can change the world for a person. My whole world changed a year ago for the better because of that uh, opportunity. So when we say we wanna see more from you, as a casting director, as an agent. It's not just because we really want that part. It's because you can help move the world in a better direction. And I don't think, you know, when, when you're looking at something through a business lens and you're like, okay, I need a big star for this role or I need somebody who's gonna sell tickets, you're not necessarily thinking of the impact that you can have on the little guy, on the little trans guy who was living in Tucson, Arizona a year ago. You know, you don't think about that, but um, I feel like this is the arts community. Everyone is welcome. You know, this is probably, it's, this is not math or um, politics or even like engineering. You know, this is the arts. It collects the people who aren't welcome in other places. And I feel like it's our responsibility to keep casting a wider net to bring in more people um, because that's what makes this so great and that's what attracts people to a career in the arts. So personally, I would love to see more theaters take that first step because we're obviously here. Um, so use us, find us. We want, we want to be found. Uh, that's what I would like to see happen with agents and directors and such. MJ, before we get to you, I'd like to ask Aja as well. Um, as a playwright, um, where would you like to see doors opening? Um. So this is a <laughs> compound answer. So I didn't answer the last question, which was about politics. And I want to say that um, I definitely identify as a political person, like from jump. Like I studied women's and gender studies, you know, in grad school. Um, although I was, I felt galvanized by theater. Actually, the vagina monologues, like which I did like five times uh, <laughs> in college, really. For, yeah, it was like I was in it four times and directed it once. It was a co-directing thing. It was terrible. But uh, don't don't have four directors for a show. But um, but it was like that really. I wasn't sure what I wanted to study in grad school, and then I was like women's and gender studies, and then I went back to grad school for experimental theater. And I think that yes, like my my being influences my politics, right? Because I want to have a nice life, as I say when I go to things like undoing racism, like as a black queer person, you know, who's trans and, and fat and non-binary, et cetera. I would like to have a nice life. I would like to have a family and not, you know, be afraid of them being murdered, you know, in the streets, et cetera. And so that is inherently political. But, but I'll also say that for me, it's all about allocation of resources. Like, I feel like people act very confused when it comes to allocation of resources, right? Like, they're down with you until they're like, wait, you want me to do something <laughs> with the resources that I have access to? Um, outside of what I've already been doing, right? So um, so I feel like it, I'm very clear on this. I actually was at the, um, the town hall on gender, which was in response to Southern Comfort at the public, uh, because the public theater got yelled at a lot for casting uh, cis people in trans roles, right? Um, which frankly, like I heard what they had to say, still no excuses for it, stop, stop doing it, stop doing it. Not, it's not that hard actually, stop. Um, as an administrator, I understand the process and still stop it. Um, so as a playwright, I have to say, stop programming plays by cis people about trans people. There's not enough slots in the season. We don't have enough resources for that nonsense. Maybe one day when all of us are just working and taking our pick and trying the different fruits of our labor and putting the fruit down and saying, no, that's not for me. I think I'll, I think I'll pass on that one, thank you. Then, then we can talk about maybe programming 
these sort of things or casting uh, cis people in trans roles, but we don't have in this capitalist society that we've set up enough resources for all of that nonsense, so stop doing that. And, and if you want a play about trans people, then look for some trans writers because also I'll guarantee you the roles will be more complex, interesting, and better, juicier parts for our talented friends here, right? That's what I have to say about that. I, I just want to piggyback on that. It is absolutely true for many, many groups in theater and, and, and motion pictures that, you know, people talk about, is it, you know, is it appropriate? Does it help the storyline? The truth is trans actors want first crack at the trans roles. Black actors want first crack at the black roles. Asians, differently abled people, we want the work, we need the work, and we're asking for it, and pretty strongly, too. Right, and can I just mm -hmm. also say, um, I agree with you as far as that, and I wanna go specifically into who they cast as far as the tr um, transgender role, which are cisgendered men. Um, I have nothing against cisgendered men, I but do. a cisgendered <laughs> man. Oh! Oh! I do. <laughs> but I don't have anything against cisgendered men, but I do have something against them playing trans roles. I would rather a cisgendered woman go into a role as me versus a, a, a cisgendered male. Reason being is because that retracts to us as trans women or vice versa for trans men, but specifically towards trans women, it retracts to us as men in dresses when men play roles for us, and that's disrespectful to us. And I know that's blunt, but it's true. And that's why we need to alleviate that thought process of what the masses think. When they do that, they create this space of the people thinking, oh yeah, that's they're supposed to be noticeable. No, that's not the case. We come in all array of things. We call it, come in all different shape, shapes and sizes. And that should not be the case for them to just be like, we should be detectable. That's disrespectful. If we were played by a cis woman, I mean, we had a wonderful actress, um, Julianne Huff, Huffman. Uh, Felicity Huffman. Felicity Huffman, excuse my name. Excuse, excuse her name. Yeah, Felicity Huffman, she play, I thought she did a wonderful job as playing a trans woman. And I think she did justice to it. And not to mention, she was a cisgendered woman. Um, a lot of these men that play these roles, it's almost like a mockery. It's almost like a mockery, and it's almost like they're doing drag. And that's what not what we as trans women are. And vice versa, if there was a woman to play a trans male role, that shouldn't happen. Can I do a tiny piece yes, on that? Yes. I promise I'm gonna keep this short. Um, this summer, I got, I got cast as, um, as a recurring guest star on a new show on USA. Um, the casting was looking for a trans person. They originally wanted a trans male, then they expanded it, they wanted it to be a trans character. And in the character breakdown, they had also said that we want this character to be a trans character, but we will never comment on the fact that this character is trans, and that is the comment that we're making. And I was fortunate enough, you know, I, I was the right type, I had the right energy, I, I cast the role. And for a long time, because I've had experiences, I'm sure, um, my brothers and sisters here have had, you know, this idea that you don't look trans enough, mm -hmm. which is basically we That's have this one. idea mm -hmm. of That's what a trans one. person looks like, and you're either too feminine or not feminine enough, right. or you know, whatever that is. Um, and I, I thought that this was going to be that. I thought, well, if we're never going to comment about it, then how are they going to know I'm trans? And then I, what dawned on me is that somebody in the powers that be in that show decided we want to give work to trans actors and we don't want to make a mockery of it. This person is going to be educated. This person is not going to be a stereotypical trans character, and we're looking for somebody who is right for that role. And when we got done with the show, I thanked the creator of that show. I said, you're not a trans person. I'll forgive you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that you did not want to make money of making us miserable, that mm -hmm. you wanted to give us an authentic, respectable representation. And to the end of my life, I will remember that at one point, at one point in my career, I came across someone 
who wanted to do something which has to be commercially viable. I mean, it's on TV, it has to have audiences. But they also thought of respecting the people that they were showing. And it's a culturally diverse show. You know, I mean, the three leads of the show, one person is black, one person is Asian, another person is French, and another person is a Jewish man. And I want, and I think what we all want, we want more people to see it that, not thinking, okay, well, if we have to have a trans character, then this character has to be pathetic, so the audience will feel <laughs> sorry for us. None of us want anybody to feel sorry for us. We want to be respected, we want to be acknowledged, and we want to be included in society as who we are. Mm -hmm. So that was my piggyback, sorry. Great, no, um, I would like to also know, um, there's been a discussion about how we, uh, the community in general, uh, healthcare certainly, can better support the trans community because I think uh, it was an education for me as well to learn um, that there's a great deal of your journey that goes along that we don't see on stage, the personal journey for trans actors. There's housing, there's healthcare, things like that that are at some can be barriers to booking a job. Um, your, your life as an artist is deep, can be af af greatly affected by that. How can the arts community, how can healthcare, how can we as a community in general support and, and better serve the trans community? Can I say, I think the most, the most important thing to me um, as far as healthcare or anything as far as what perks are involved with, whether it be equity or SAG, I think there should be some type of insurance cover for HRT. Because that is one of the most, if you, are, if you do plan on moving forward, or, or not even moving forward, moving to another part of your transition, that's an important part of it. And I think that that should be incorporated with these health plans or health insurance or whatever the case may be. There are a lot of perks that are given to equity actors, beautiful perks. You can get a nice, cute little zip car. You can get a nice, you know, you can get a lot of these things. You know, I mean, that's, that's what comes with these perks. It's wonderful. But there are certain, you get great insurance on certain things as well. But there's one thing, if, if we are going to be trans actresses and actors, within the, the industry, we need help too. Because we some, some of us can't move forward without those specific, specific essential needs. And I think that's one of them that we need. Okay. Well, I, 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 I can talk again. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it, being, being in theater uh, is one of the places where it's still a, you know, considered appropriate to cast you based on the way that you look. Um, like you wouldn't, if you were applying for a job at a newspaper, they wouldn't say, well, you're just, we needed somebody who was over 5'6". But in theater, that kind of thing is still, you know, very specific. You have to look a certain way. Theater thinks, a theater and film, any kind of uh, art like that, um, still thinks very binary, you know, well, it's either a male role or it's a woman's role. So there are certain things that you're um, expected to look like in order to get work. And that's just the industry. Then there's the rest of the world where you know, there are certain ways that you're expected to look if you don't wanna get you know, beat up or worse, or if you wanna live your life happily. Um, you know, these, these boxes, these gender norms that people uh, ascribe to you, whether you identify that way or not, whether you identify as non-binary, people still expect to see you in a certain way. Um, so in, in my personal case, um, I'm pursuing uh, surgery right now, it's called top surgery. It's to you know, remove the giant weight off my chest. And um, you have to work a certain number of weeks at equity in order to get health insurance through equity, and I am one week shy. So somebody booked me for a one week of a show. And um, so right now I'm on Medicaid, which should be a great thing, because it's New York State. And New York State has passed a, a, a law, their Medicaid guidelines, saying that it, um, any Medicaid like MCO, whether you have like Health First or Fidelis, has to cover transgender related healthcare. And I recently was turned down for it with one of these um, uh, plans and the individual plans are able to like come up with whatever kind of little hoops they wanna make you jump through and you know, they'll deny you the first time then you have to appeal and maybe they'll approve it on the appeal and it can be a really, really, really long process. And not only does that affect my life, like when I, I, this is a safe space, I feel very good sitting here. Uh, when I leave here, as soon as I start walking down the street and I get on the subway and I have to go home, I'm looking at everybody because I don't want to get clocked. 
I don't, I'm worried that somebody's gonna notice that my tie doesn't sit flat on my chest, you know? So it affects my life, it also affects my job. You know, it's gonna affect if I can wear that costume or if I can be cast as a certain role. So, you know, I, this, this doesn't have much to do with, with uh, the artistic community per se as much as it does the transgender community. But when, when you offer the support to um, transgender people that they need, the medical care that is absolutely necessary, it's not a choice, it's not cosmetic, it's not just because you want calf implants because you think they look cool, like it's medically necessary, um, you're making that person a more positive and um, capable member of society. You know, they're going to provide more to the world because they're healthy and happy now. So, um, like MJ was saying, you know, I, I, since I don't have the health insurance yet, I'm only slightly familiar with what equity offers, but I know that they don't cover um, hormone replacement therapy and things like that, or at least that's what I've heard. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. So. Um, you know, if you, if you want good actors who are going to really be, you know, at the top of their game because the, they embody their true selves and their authentic identity, then opening doors like that uh, and covering things like that is important and it's going to benefit you in the long run. It's going to benefit your production and the, the arts as a whole in the long run. I just want to say, not specifically about health insurance, but the tremendous pressure on appearance you know, it's wonderful that we are making these great inroads and, and, you know, both as performers and writers and administrators. But this is a tough industry. It's a tough business, whether you're trans or not. And I, um, a friend of mine um, was cast in a cable series a few years ago. And I called my agent at the time, and I said, I didn't even know about this. Why didn't you send me on this? You know? She said, well, they wanted someone around 30. I said, but she's the love interest. The leading man is my age. She said, welcome to Hollywood, dear. <laughs> I mean, I will also say that when you, hmm. okay, first of all, breakdowns, right? Um, you need to know who you're looking for. You can't find who you're looking for if you don't know how to use the right words, right? So you need to know what we're called and how we respond, right? What is a trans man? What is a trans woman? What is the difference between those things? <laughs> and when you say trans man, trans woman, you know, and just like jumble them up, it's very confusing. Like we actually don't know if you're talking to us or not because right. it's like, well, that's, are you, it's like you who, yeah, <laughs> which <laughs> one? <laughs> said, so we both can you know, Right. So, um, so make sure that your breakdown says what you want it to say, um, just, just basically, and, and also for the entire industry, maybe have somebody look at it and just tell you if you're being offensive. You right. know, right. just tell you if you're being offensive. Like, make that someone's job, where they're just like, I'm gonna tell you the truth here. That's not what, uh, that's not what those people like to be called. You know, so, so there's that, but also, you know, I know trans people who are working, who are doing very well, but, um, but who don't feel good when they book those jobs, right? Because they go into the theater, they're constantly misgendered, right? Like it's not okay to invite us into your house and then not treat us respectfully, okay? So you need to keep up with the pronouns. I have lots of feelings about and, and suggestions for that, but one of the biggest ones, which I think is, is the most radical because there's a socialization to be nice about it and, and to coach people is to practice, right? We learn our lines, you learn your lines, right? <laughs> so you, you get a scene partner and you practice until you get those pronouns right because I don't want to hear it. Um, that's, I mean, really, go, go do that somewhere else because like the moment it slips out of your mouth, it's ruined the entire interaction. And although I might smile and be like, oh yeah, it's hard sometimes. <laughs> no, I haven't forgotten and it's, it's really ruined the experience. Make sure there are bathrooms that people can use, right? Which means that you may want to ask people what kind of bathroom they would like to go to. I like a single stall, right? Because I like privacy in the bathroom. No, one, no matter what I'm doing in there, I don't want another person in there with me. Um, so like those basic things, but also pay people, please pay people. I understand, listen, I'm an emerging playwright, I understand how there's not any money, uh, but, <laughs> but um, 
But I feel like people are especially looking for trans women of color and trans women of color of a certain age. Mm -hmm. And they're like looking and looking and they're like, we can't find her. Where is she? And I'm like, you know, she she needs to, to eat, right? Like we need to eat, we need to pay these bills. And, and also people say that, you know, well, I can't find the trained actors. And it's like, well, okay, first of all, they do exist, so. But also, it's like, are you calling them the right thing? You know, first of all. But but also, um, how do you expect people to have the experience and like stay up on their game when they're not getting the work and they're not getting getting paid, right? So really thinking about uh, quality of, of life, human rights, how you would like to experience things. And if you can't see those things because you have a blind spot, then again, you need to get, have somebody come in and say, nope, that's not, a, no, nope, nope. The, the costume fitting, like maybe everyone just needs to have their own private moment. Do you have like a shade or something? Uh, and also costuming. And I say that also as a lifelong fat person. Your costume people will need to be on it and be respectful, right? So first of all, they, they do need to read up and maybe you do need some extra room in the chest for me. Um, like maybe you do need to know how to like deal with all of this, you know, like this junk in the trunk and like these thighs. <laughs> um, but also be respectful about it, right? So like I don't want to hear about how hard it is for you to, to make a suit for me um, or what you need to right. do, right? What kind of undergarments we need to make sure everything is staying where we want it to be while we're on stage and and also that when these lights hit us you're not seeing things that like that we can't see right so like have our backs when it comes to that um and it shouldn't even be a question like that shouldn't even be a question because that's a professional job like we do our jobs as professional like right. you said to do to act to sing they should know exactly what they need to, if you are if you don't know how to say it i was always taught don't say it at all right <laughs> you do your job and when you do your job get a promotion honey. I mean so like <laughs> yeah I feel like we all just want to feel like dignified professionals right. you know like that's that's right. really it and so it's like if you need to tell me that you know like that my my binding has slipped or something like that's fine there's a way to do that like right we have ways to tell actors that they're having a problem with their costume and like that's totally fine but but just remember that we all deserve dignity um, and so we should really have each other's backs and also um, and also we want you to have a dignified interaction with us like we don't want you to just be like out there looking stupid so like again <laughs> maybe have a consultant or somebody who, who's on that job to help you interact with us and I think this is a pan this panel is a great start in getting that dialogue going but um, individually how would each of you like to see uh, more trans people become in power positions how how do we get more trans people to become the decision makers who are casting how do we make sure the casting directors are talking to the trans community that you've got someone who's an executive director or an artistic director. I mean, we've got Shakina Nifak, who's mm. a great, wonderful ally, and she's running her own company right now. Um, and she has, has made sure that there's room for trans uh, writers in her development series. But um, what's the way forward? I think we need to, um, well, one, we need to start, a step, all of us, whether it be trans or non-trans, I think we need to start developing like genuine relationships and getting understanding and once you get an understanding then I feel like especially within the industry everyone has contacts everyone has whether they be called good or bad it's still a contact and once you start creating that revenue for um, moving forward and pressing forward and making things happen I think when you put that on a certain platform it's gonna go farther than what you ever even thought but we need to start in a genuine place of creating friendships and, and, and camaraderie. If we don't have that, that's not gonna happen. There, if there's no togetherness, that's not going to happen. And um, yeah, that's what I think. I, th I just think that needs to happen. I just think <laughs> that needs to happen. You have to be genuine and you have to create, you have to be in a space where you know you feel safe. Whether it, like I said, whether it be trans or non-trans, when you do that, moves forward. and. I say this, it may sound cheesy, and I don't care, because I truly believe it. We have to start loving without conditions, honey. Mm. We love too much with conditions. We love each other with too many conditions. It sucks. We need to start loving each other without them, and I promise you, when we start doing that as a whole, things will move forward. They will. I, I, I think, you know, I come from an acting point of view, but I really think the next step really is getting more um, trans people in the writer's room mm -hmm. and programming more um, plays by trans writers. Mm -hmm. You know, trans directors, hire an assistant trans director, you know. Um, 
get a trans camera person. Um, but like you said, in those positions of power, um, transparent um, has Jana. Mm -hmm. You know, they specifically wanted a trans person in the writer's room. And they searched for one, and um, she didn't have experience doing that. And she was taught, and now she's part of it. And um, trans people in casting offices, you know, um, if casting directors can't find someone, you know, there are trans people out there that can help them find mm -hmm. someone. You know, there's no excuse anymore because um, most agents, you know, that, that I've worked with, they, they, they know someone on call that they can send because there's so much work. Um, and like I said, you know, in those positions of power and influence, very, very important. You know, if a trans actor playing a trans role brings an authenticity, then imagine what happens when the writer of a trans story is trans. I'd like to, um, we have about five minutes left. Are there any questions that anyone would like to? Yeah. Hi, down in the front. I'm just curious as to what, since all of you identify as actors in some way, um, what your dream role would be. Great, I'm just gonna repeat. Uh, the question is um, what every uh, artist up here, what their dream role would be. Oh, well, um, it's been this since I was 10, and my transition's not going to change it, so the witch and into the woods. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, you guys are going to laugh. Uh, I'm an 80s kid. I grew up with Dynasty. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I always thought if they, if they redo it, you know what, I am just perfect to play the head bitch. <laughs> I even have the right coloring. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to do a big budget action thriller opposite Tom Hardy. Well, who, well, who wouldn't? You asked. Well, well, since I'm a theater girl, clearly I want Peggy. Like, I just want that. <laughs> but the, the main one that I know I would deliver in is Glinda. I want to be Glinda in Wicked, and I know I would deliver Devour. I would devour. Yeah. Right? That would be amazing. Sorry. Interesting. <laughs> you know, I don't really think of myself like, as an actor in other people's plays anymore. Um, I mean, circling back around the leadership, I would love to be an artistic director in somebody's theater. So that's a nice role. Um, <laughs> for, for me, I mean, also I'm really passionate about literary management, but like I have, I write my own work now. And so I, like, I don't necessarily see myself in my own work, but sometimes, and I, would love for one of my plays to be up at, you know, Soho Rep, the public, like, you know, I like the role as playwright on opening night. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Um, sorry, just, uh, hi, here in, in, uh, on the end. <laughs> we commissioned a very big William study two years ago for SAG after on, on the state of the LGBT actor in the business. And out of over 5,000 respondents, which we, we sent out surveys to people's homes where they did it filled out in their privacy in their own home, we only had seven people within SAG after identify as trans in a big survey. And for me, serving on that board, 
you know, I just want to say that um, at first I thought you were coming from sort of a scolding place. Oh. And, and you're not. Oh, no. But um, I do think it is important as, for a trans artist. It, it is a sort of, it works both ways, you know. And uh, we have to show up for things that, you know, like filling out paperwork and things like that, surveys and, and doing things. It's very important, you know. Um, MJ and I have been cast in a play that's going to be at ART in January, and um, Joe Bonney's the director, and Paul Lucas, the writer. They sent out um, uh, the breakdown. After breakdown, after breakdown, after breakdown, they flew to different cities um, looking for trans actors. And the response that they got was really, really poor. And what I'm learning, you know, it has to be, we, you know, and, and one person, one person's agent said, she's not interested in doing theater, you know? And, you know, it's true. I mean, you get to yes, a point sure. where you do pick and choose, and that's great. But, you know, there are the casting agents that say they didn't and they didn't really try, but I know these people really tried. And the response was um, was underwhelming. And I think it's important um, that we, we, have, we have to show up. We have to show up. Right. We're not all going to be the next Laverne Cox. And even Laverne Cox did a lot, a lot of theater. She did a lot of small theater, tiny little independent films. So when the big moment arrived, she was ready. And I think trans performers, especially young trans performers, they have to, be, they have to realize we have to pay our dues just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, and we have to show up. We have time for one more question in the hat, yeah? Can I ask you to repeat the question so everyone can hear? Um, the question is about the lack of diversity in mainstream films about trans characters. Specifically and, racial diversity. Yes, racial diversity. I feel like intersectionality is so important yeah. here, right? So we're here to talk about um, trans theater artists, but when you ask this question about leadership, I'm thinking about Who's the, you know, because when I look for opportunities at places, I look at their leadership. I go and see who is in charge here. And, you know, I'll see a place and it's like white people, white people, white people, white people, white people, you know, and it's just like, okay, so there may or may not actually be a permanent seat for me at the table. This may be like, you know, a table that you just set up and put out a paper plate on for me, you know, in this moment, because it's not a permanent part of your agenda. So I think we really have to look at hiring practices and, and who we're really putting in the positions of power so that consistently there's this support. And we know that we have a race problem in this country, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So then we have, you know, people who are multiply marginalized and it's like, okay, so yes, we have tangerine. That's what we have, but, uh, <laughs> What a, I mean, what a, that's I, I I feel you on that one. I I have seen and I'm this is no this is in no way bashing any Caucasian person because we all deserve a role, but there's a sad reality that we we as African American or people who are multiracial or of color we're not seen and some of that is because some of us feel like we don't need to be be seen because it's already happening and we're like, okay, well they got it already, we're not gonna do it. That's the mentality, because that's been instilled in us. But there needs to be, there need, that door needs to be open and there needs to be uh, uh, an accepting um, hug or whatever to let us know and reassure us that we are deserving of being in more mainstream or big TV or, or theater shows. But right now we don't have that. We don't have those groups telling us go and audition. We don't. Have, we uh, and 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 that retrospect as far as African Americans, I feel um, this is 
such a, this is so like touchy, but um, that 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 word privilege trickles in, and um, it shows within the screen, and that's just that, and sometimes that's just the way it is. But I feel like we just have to work harder and show that there doesn't need to be any privilege, and if you do have it, it needs to be equal, and it, that we can we can have that privilege as well. I hope that made sense. Well, especially when you're doing diversity programming. So I know last night, the uh, playwrights in their identity panel, uh, they were talking about, right, like Black History Month, right? right. And that's like, that's your slot, right? And so if we're looking at like what is getting programmed, and I'm think talking more theatrically here because I am a theater maker and that's, that's where I work. But also, you know, it's kind of the same thing for Hollywood, right? Like we get like our one, one Medea movie a, a year, right. you know, <laughs> or like, you know, let's go find the, the black hotties and like put them in that one movie. We got Taraji in them, right? So um, if that's all we get, Right, like black people, we get one, two movies. Like that's all we get. It's not gonna be a trans movie, right? It's not gonna be uh, a movie where they're dealing respectfully with trans characters. So I feel like we really gotta look at this intersectionality because when we blow it open so that there's more space for all these stories, then we get the nuance and the layering of things. Uh, but when we get one trans story, it's gonna be a white trans story, right? Mm -hmm. If we get one black story, it's gonna be a cis story. Yeah, you because know, they ain't ready right now. Mm -hmm. But they need to get ready. <laughs> and with that, unfortunately, I wish we had more time to talk. But I think that's a great way to end it. It leaves us all with something to think about and discuss as we leave. Um, I want to thank every one of these incredible panelists for joining us tonight. It's an honor sharing the stage with all of you. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>